Section 22 of Astounding Stories 11, November 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Dempsey, Highland, New York. Astounding Stories 11, November 1930, by Various. Vagabonds of Space. Chapter 7 Rapaju Didis was setting up and adjusting the complicated mechanisms of his little black case. A dozen vacuum tubes lighted, and a murmur of throbbing energy came from a helix of shining metallic ribbon that topped the whole. Flexible cables led to a cap-like contrivance, which Didis placed on his head. He frowned in concentration. The psycho-ray apparatus, Aura explained. He's sending a message to the city. Evidently, the influence of the ray was directive. They had no inkling of the thoughts transmitted from the alert brain of the scientist, but from the look of satisfaction on his face they could see that he was obtaining the desired contact. Rapajou! he exclaimed, switching off the power of his instrument. Commander of the fleet of the Lotta. I have advised him of our arrival, told him that a Martian and a terrestrial wish to treat with him concerning the proposed invasion of their planets. His answering thought first was of fiercest rage, then conciliatory in nature. He'll receive you and listen to your arguments, though he promises nothing. Is that satisfactory? Yes, Carr and Mado were agreed. At least it would give them a chance to look over the ground and to make plans, should any occur to them. The nomads circled over the heart of the city, and soon Mado saw a suitable landing space. They settled gracefully in an open area, close by the building indicated by Didis as that of the administration officials of the city. A group of squat, sullen Lotta awaited them, and, without speaking a word either of hatred or welcome, led them into the forbidding entrance of the building. Close-set, beady eyes, unbelievably flat features of chalky whiteness, chunky, bowed legs, bare and hairy, long arms with huge, dangling paws, these were the outstanding characteristics of the Lotta. Mado stared straight before him, refusing to display any great interest in the loathsome creatures, but Carr was frankly curious, and as frankly disapproving. Rapaju leered maliciously when the four voyagers stood before him. He looked the incarnation of all that was evil and vile, a monster among monsters. Sensing him to be the more aggressive of the two visitors from doomed planets, he addressed his remarks to Carr. "'You come to plead with the Rapaju,' he sneered, his coast tinged with an outlandish accent, "'to beg for the worthless lives of your compatriots, for the wealth of your cities.' "'We come to reason with you,' replied Carr haughtily, "'if you are capable of reasoning. "'What is this incredible thing you are planning?' Mado gasped at the effrontery of his friend, but Carr was oblivious of the warning looks cast in his direction. "'Enough of that!' snapped Rapaju. "'I'll do the talking, you the reasoning. "'I have a proposition to make you, and if you know what's best, you'll agree.' Otherwise, you'll be the first of the terrestrials to die. Is that clear? Clear enough, all right, growled Carr. What do you mean, a proposition? Ha! I thought you'd listen. My offer is the lives of you and your companion in exchange for your assistance in guiding my fleet to the capital cities of your countries. Not that our plans will be changed if you refuse, but that much time will be saved in this manner and quick victory made certain without undue sacrifice of valuable property. You! You! Carr stammered in anger. But there was no use in raising a rumpus now. They'd only kill him. Something might be accomplished if he pretended to accede. Go on with your story, he finished lamely. In addition to sparing your lives, I'll place you both in high position after we seize your respective planets, make you chief officers in the prison lands we intend to establish for your countrymen. 
What do you say? Will you give us time to talk it over and think about it? Until the hour of departure, if you wish. Carr bowed, avoiding Mado's questioning eyes. He looked at Aura, where she stood at the side of Didis. She flashed him a guarded smile. He knew that she understood. Rapaju relaxed. He was confident he could bribe these puerile foreigners to help him in the great venture, and sadly, he needed such help. The Lotta were not navigators. Their knowledge of the heavens was sadly incomplete. They had no maps of the surfaces of the planets to be visited. Their simultaneous blows would be far more effective and the campaign much shorter if they could choose the most vital centers for the initial attacks. Now, he said, that we understand one another, let us talk further of the plans. Then you will be able to consider carefully before making your decision. Rapaju could be diplomatic when he wished. Carr longed to sink his fingers in the hairy throat, but he smiled hypocritically and found an opportunity to wink meaningfully at Mado. This was going to be good, and who knew? Perhaps they might find some way to outwit these mad savages. To think of them in control of the inner planets was revolting. They retired to a small room with Rapaju and four of his lieutenants, Didis and Aura accompanying them. Aura sat close to Carr at the circular table in Rapaju's council. Carr thought grimly of the board meetings in faraway New York. Rapaju talked. He told of the armament of his vessels, painting vivid pictures of the destruction to be wrought in the cities of Terra, of Mars and Venus. His Great hairy paws clutched at imaginary riches when he spoke glowingly of the plundering to follow. He spoke of the women of the inner planets, and Carr half rose from his seat when he observed the lecherous glitter in his beady eyes. Aura, great God, was she safe here? He stole a glance at the girl, and a recurrence of the awful fear surged through him. In her leather garment, close-fitting and severe, she looked like a boy. Perhaps they would not know. Besides, there was the perpetual treaty with Europa. It always had been observed, Didis said. As Rapaju expanded upon the glories to come, he told, perforce, of many of the details of the plans. One thing stood out in Carr's mind. The vessels of the Lotta were not equal to the Nomad in many respects. They must carry their entire supply of fuel from the starting point and this was calculated as but a small percentage in excess of that required to carry them to their destination. Their speed was not as great as the Nomad's, by at least a third. If the Nomad led the fleet from Ganymede, they might be able to get them off their course, cause them to run out of fuel out in the vacuum and absolute zero of space. He kicked Mado under the table and arose to ask a few leading questions. Aura was whispering to her father, and he nodded his head as if in complete agreement with what she was saying. These two were not deceived by his apparent traitorous talk, but Maida was aghast. Carr wondered if Rapaju believed him, as did his friend. "'We'll do it, Rapaju,' he stated finally. "'In our ship, the Nomad, we'll guide you across the trackless wastes of the heavens. We'll take you to our capital cities.' point out to you the richest of the industrial centers. We have no love for our own worlds. Mado and I deserve them for a life of vagabondage among the stars. We ask no reward other than that we be permitted to leave once more on our travels, to roam space as we choose. Mado attempted to voice an objection, but Carr's hand was heavy on his shoulder. Shut up, you fool! He hissed in his ear. Can't you trust me? Rapaju's eyes seemed to draw closer together as he returned Carr's unflinching stare. He walked around the table and stood at the side of the tall terrestrial. Suddenly he grasped Aura's jacket, tore it open at the throat. He ran his hairy fingers over the bare shoulder of the shrinking girl and gurgled in delight at the velvet smoothness of her skin. With a roar like a wild animal, Carr was upon him, bearing him to the floor. His fingers were in that hairy throat where they had itched to twine. "'Dirty, filthy beast!' he was snarling. "'Lay your foul hands on Aura, will you? "'Say your prayers if you know any, you swine!' "'Then his muscles went limp. 
and he was jerked to his feet by a terrible force, a force that sent him reeling and gasping against the wall. One of Rapaju's lieutenants stood before him with a tiny weapon in his hand. The weapon, which had released the paralyzing gas he breathed, he was choking, suffocating. A black mist rose before him. He felt his knees give way. Dimly, as in a dream, he saw that Aura was in Dita's arms. Rapaju was on his feet, fingering his neck and laughing horribly. The treaty, Rapaju! Ditas was shouting. Aura was sobbing. Mado was in the hands of two of the vile Lota, struggling wildly to free himself. The Martian's eyes accused him. He shut his own and groaned, opened them again, but it was no use. Everything in the room was whirling now, crazily. He fought to regain his senses, crawled weakly toward the squat figure of Rapaju, where it swayed and twisted and spun around. Then all was darkness. The gas had taken its toll. Chapter 8 The Expedition Carr awakened to a sense of wordless disgust. Fool that he was to spill the beans as he had, all set to put one over on the leader of the Lotta, then to come a cropper like this. He knew he had been spared for a purpose. The gas was not intended to kill, only to render him helpless for a time. He opened his eyes to the light of the familiar room. He had awakened before in his bed. It was his own cabin on board the Nomad. What had happened? Had he dreamed it all? Europa? Aura? Rapaju? All of it? He sat up and felt his aching head. Oh, are you awake? A soft voice greeted him. Aura! he exclaimed. It was indeed she, beautiful as ever. Shh! she warned, placing the tip of a finger to his lips. They'll hear us. Who? he whispered. Rapaju? His two guards? They're in the control cabin with Father and Mado. What? They've taken the Nomad? Yes, we're under way. They've forced Mado to guide them. But do not trust him. Rapaju spared you, as he believes you more capable. He'll hold you to your word. Lord, but what are you doing here? Aura dropped her eyes. He, Rapaju, she said, inferred from your action in assaulting him that you were very fond of me. He holds me as a hostage for your good behavior. Father volunteered to come along. He persuaded Rapaju to allow it, swore allegiance to his cause. Of course, he wouldn't leave me. Carr gazed at her in admiration of her courage. She had been nursing him, too. What a girl she was. Aura, he said huskily. Rapaju was right. I am fond of you. More than fond. I love you. I never knew I could feel this way. Oh, Carr, you mustn't. She drew back as he scrambled to his feet. They'll find us. We must not show that we care. Rapaju is a beast. He wants me for himself, and is delaying the time only until you have brought the fleet safely to the inner planets, and to their great cities. He— The skunk! Wants you to himself, does he? Why— Why didn't I kill him? But, Aura, you said you do care— Ha! I thought so! Rapaju stood in the doorway, grinning mockingly at the pair. The impetuous terrestrial is up and about, back at his old game. Please, please, for my sake, Carr. Aura pressed him back as he tensed his muscles for a spring. Sorry I was so slow, Carr grated over her shoulder. Another five seconds, Rapaju, and I'd have had your windpipe out by the roots. Rapaju scowled darkly and fingered his throat. But, my dear Carr, you were too slow, he said. And I live, and shall live, while you shall die. Meanwhile, you'll carry out your agreement. Come, Aura. The girl hesitated for a moment, then, with a pleading glance at Carr, stepped from the room. All right now, Parker, snapped Rapaju, into your clothes and into the pilot's seat. You'll stay there, too, till the journey's over. Get busy. One of his guards had appeared in the doorway. Carr knew that resistance was useless. Besides, seated at those controls, he might think of something. 
Rapaju would never get Aura if he could help it. Mado's shoulders drooped, and his face was haggard and drawn, but he summoned a smile when he saw Carr. Hello, Carr, he said. You all right? Sure. Rapaju says I've got to take the controls. Very well. Mado shrugged his broad shoulders and slipped from the pilot's seat. Two ugly Lata guards were watching, ray pistols in hand. The chart is corrected, Carr, and... Never mind the conversation, Rapaju snarled. There'll be no talk between you at all. Beat it to your cabin, Mado. The Martian glowered and made as if to retort hotly. But, Rapaju, Ditas interposed, speaking from his position at one of the ports, they'll have to consult regarding the course of the vessel. Mado is more familiar than Carr with the navigation of space. Shut up! roared Rapaju. I know what I'm doing, and what's more, you'll not converse with him either. I'm running this expedition, and I'm not taking any chances. Didis subsided, and followed Mado through the passage to the sleeping cabins. The ensuing silence was ominous. Carr could feel the eyes of the Lotta upon him as he examined the adjustments of the controls and peeped through the telescope. A glance at the velocity indicator showed him that they were traveling at a rate of eight hundred miles a second. He studied the chart and soon made out their position. Jupiter was a hundred million miles behind them, and they were heading almost due sunward. The automatic control mechanism was not functioning. Evidently, Mado had kept this a secret, and for a purpose. He wished he could talk with his friends. They'd plan something. Like your job? Rapaju was gloating over his terrestrial, who had dared to lay hands upon him. Yes, but not the company. Carr was disdainful. You like it less before I've finished with you, and get this straight. You think we're dependent on you to guide us to the inner planets, and that we'll not harm any of you until they are reached. Don't fool yourself. I've watched Mado, and I've spent much time in the excellent library of the Nomad. I've learned plenty about the navigation of space, and can reach those planets as quickly and directly as you. But it pleases me to see you work. So work you shall. I'll check you carefully, and don't think you can deceive me. Don't try to depart from the true course. The sun is my check as it is yours, and I'll keep constant tab on your position. Get it? A rather long speech, Rapaju. Carr grinned into the evil face of the commander. Still defiant, eh? Suits me, Carr Parker. We'll have some nice talks here, and then... When it pleases me, you'll suffer. You shall live to see your home city crash in utter ruin, your people slain, starved, beaten, and above all, there's Aura. Don't defile her name in your ugly mouth, you— Carr bit his tongue to keep back the torrent of invectives that sprang to his lips. This would never do. He'd get himself bumped off before they were well started, and while there was life, there was hope. He'd stick to his guns, and think. Think and plan. If only he could have a few words with Mado. They must get out of this mess. There must be a way. There must. Rapaju was laughing in triumph. Thought he had cowed him, did he? Boastful savage. If he could navigate the nomad himself, why didn't he? Liar. He and Mado were godsends to him, and he knew it. His speech at the council table had been the real truth. Foreign thoughts entered his mind. Didis, good old Didis, was using his thought apparatus in his own cabin. He paid no attention to the words of Rapaju when he left the control room. Didis was on the job. Between them they'd outwit this devil of Ganymede. Keep your courage, came the message. I've read the thoughts of Mado, and he bids you examine the chart carefully. He's made some notations in the ancient language of Mars. The automatic control of the Nomad can be used when necessary. He has not advised Rabaju of its existence. Carr was encouraged, and he concentrated on a suitable reply. But, though he did not consciously will it, his thoughts were of Aura. Instantly there came the reassurance of her father. 
Aura is not in immediate danger. Rabaju is saving her for his revenge on you, and I'm watching her constantly. A ray pistol is concealed in my clothing, its charge ready for the foul creature in case he should lay hands on her, but you must plan an escape, and salvation for your worlds. Examine the chart at once. He looked from the corner of his eye, and saw that one of the lot of guards was watching intently. He peered into the eyepiece of the telescope, made an inconsequential change in one of the adjustments. The guard stirred, but did not arise. He looked at the chart with new interest, scanned its markings carefully. What had Mado marked for his attention? There were hundreds of notations, some in Kos and a few in ancient Martian. All in Mado's painstaking chirography. Ah, there it was, a tiny spot almost on their course, with Mado's minute notation. Sargasso C. What did it mean? Did Mado intend to lead the fleet into the embrace of that dreadful monster they had so fortunately escaped? An excellent idea to save the inner planets, but suicide for them. He'd do it, though, if it weren't for Aura. She was so sweet and innocent. She must not die, must not suffer. Another way must be found. He groaned aloud as he realized that her predicament was the result of his own bull-headedness. If only he hadn't insisted on the trip to Ganymede. But then there was the problem of preserving the civilization of the inner planets. It had to be met. There was a commotion behind him, a feminine shriek from the after-cabins, loud shoutings from the beast called Rapaju. Carr's heart skipped a beat. He was paralyzed with fear, but only for an instant. With a bellow of rage, he whirled around and started for the door, charging the two guards with head down and arms flailing. End of chapter 8 Vagabonds of Space Read by Jason Dempsey Highland, New York